So I guess we can uh, start. I was told to be sharp on this. <laughs> so uh, welcome to this uh, uh, algebraic geometry parallel session of the national meeting of the Portuguese Mathematical Society. Um, so uh, let me start by thanking uh, SPM for the invitation to organize this parallel session. Thank you to the speakers, the four speakers for accepting the invitation I made to, to speak here. And thank you also for the people attending to this session. I see here we are already 22. So a lot of people attending. Uh, online makes these things somehow easier. Um, okay, so um, before starting, let me just strongly encourage people to ask questions or make comments. Uh, I know it's not the same uh, attending an online talk as being in face-to-face, -face, uh, in a face-to-face -face talk, but uh, uh, nevertheless, feel free to ask questions. And to do it, please use the Q&A button, so the questions and answer button that you probably, I guess you see on the bottom of your screen. And uh, I would, uh, so if, if you want to ask a question on these uh, 15 minute talks, please, probably it's better that you ask it in the end so that it's, since it's a, such a short time talk, probably maybe it's better to ask a question on, in the end, okay? All right, so, but please do ask questions. Okay, let's then start. So our first speaker, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Miguel Moreira from uh, ETH Zurich. He's a PhD student there under the supervision of uh, Raul Pandripande, right? And uh, uh, welcome Miguel, and he's going to talk about counting curves in space, maps or equations. So Miguel. Okay. Thank, thank you, Andre. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and to speak uh, in this meeting. So my talk will be on um, theories that allow us to, to count curves in space. And I want to highlight uh, two different approaches, an approach that considers curves as maps, which is a bit more traditional, and uh, an approach that considers them as equations. And this, while it's not so traditional, maybe not so natural, uh, has been very useful in recent years. Uh, improving nice results about the map side. And so I, I want to, to sell you that uh, this equation side is, is very nice too. Okay, so the, this talk is on, um, oh wait. Okay, this talk is on enumerative geometry, which is a very, very old topic uh, and very interesting. And, you know, its developments uh, have been going alongside with developments of ultra geometry itself. In the last 30 years, I've seen a very, very cool progress, um, in part due to uh, new technical tools available and in part due to some insight from physics. So let me give you a few, a few model problems uh, to show you what enumerative geometry and curve counting looks like. So a very old problem that goes back to, to ancient Greece is, uh, given three generic circles in the plane, how many circles are tangent to the three of them? And the answer is eight. So this was known as a Polonius problem. Um, another problem is how many lines does a smooth cubic surface contain? And if we go back to the to the first slide, uh, this is a picture of a of a, a cubic surface with uh, with its uh, lines. And if you count, you'll see that it has twenty seven lines. And indeed, it, that's always uh, the case. So any smooth cubic surface has exactly twenty seven lines. Now, if we go to more uh, modern stuff. Uh, an interesting problem is how many conics does the generic quintic trifold contain? And this was answered uh, recently in comparison to the other, the other ones by Sheldon Katz. And the number is this, 609250. Um, and uh, he, he used some insight from physics and mirror symmetry to compute this number. Another very cool problem is to count uh, the number of rational curves of a certain degree passing through 3D minus one generic points uh, on P2. And while well, the first few numbers are one, one, 12, 
uh, 620. So these first numbers uh, have been known for a long time. And recently, Konsevich found, uh, well, uh, Konsevich proved uh, this recursive formula that gives the number in general. Okay, so uh, all of these problems have something in common that we're counting curves in some kind, in some kind of space. In, in our examples, x was the cubic, the cubic surface, the quintic threefold, or P two. Um, and these problems are easy to formulate because, um, well, in generic in generic conditions, we have a well defined number. Um, this is not always the case. So sometimes you have some enumerative problem and you cannot perturb the data in, in a way that uh, you, you get a meaningful enumerative uh, number. But, uh, but still, we've, we now have some technical tools that allow us to define such numbers, uh, even when that's not the case. Uh, and so we'll think of curves in two ways, as I, as I said in the beginning, either as a map or as equa an equation. And this is a very simple example. So here on the left, we have a, a curve thought as a map from P1 to P2, which sends the point with homogeneous coordinates XY to XY0. And then this is equivalent to saying that, you know, this is the curve cut out by the equation Z equals zero. So the first, the first approach, uh, thinking of curves as maps, is uh, led to the development of Gromovitan theory maybe 30 years ago. And indeed Gromovitan theory uses a, a, the moduli space of stable maps from curves to some space X. So this is the notation we use for the moduli of stable maps. So this is a, a space that parameterizes a, a curve C, uh, a nodal curve C, some marked points P, P1 to PM uh, in the curve C, and the map F from C to our space X. And here in the notation, we see we have a, a genus G, which is the genus of the curve. We have some positive integer, some non-negative integer, which is the number of marked points. And then we have an element in the second homology, which is um, the class of the curve. So we're considering uh, maps that map C to the class beta. Okay. and. The, the kind of uh, curve counts I've been describing, they should, they, at least morally, they are kind of integrals in this, in this moduli space. For example, the number of conics on the quintic threefold, well, in this case, for a generic quintic, this, this space is just a finite number of points. And so if we integrate one, we get the number of points, which was this number computed by Sheldon Katz. For example, this other, uh, more complicated problem of um, with the number of degree, so the number of rational curves, so genus zero of degree d passing through 3d minus one points, it can be written in, in this way. So here, uh, the, the integrand we have here is exactly saying that we ask for uh, the curve to pass through this, so this specified 3d minus one points. Okay, but this is only in situations where these moduli spaces are, are nice. So they, they are smooth, they have uh, the expected dimension and so on. But this is not always the case. These moduli spaces can be very singular. Uh, they can have, uh, for example, things that should be the boundary strata, but the boundary strata has a uh, higher dimension than they should and so on. But luckily, uh, we have now the, some technology that allows us to describe um, some numbers, even when we don't have a smooth moduli space. And this is the technology of virtual fundamental classes developed by Baron Fantec and Litian. And so their work produces uh, a class in homology, which we call the virtual fundamental class. And we denote it like this. And basically this class replaces the, the usual fundamental class. So instead of integrate to, to get invariants, instead of integrating against the usual fundamental class, we integrate against the virtual fundamental class. And this class uh, lives in uh, this, this dimension, which is the expected dimension of the moduli space. And it has this nice formula. So a particular case is when the expected dimension is zero. So this means that the moduli space uh, virtually is just a finite number of points. This might not be the case, but virtually it is. And the number of points is equal to, to the integral of one against the, the virtual fundamental class. 
Okay, and if we go back to, to the formula we had here for the virtual dimension, we see that there is a very special case in which it's always zero. So if the dimension of X is three, then this term dies. And if C1 is also zero, then this term dies. And so, and if moreover, we don't put uh, marked points, this virtual dimension is always zero. So this is exactly the case of a, a Calabi-Yau trifold. So trifold, so dimension is three, calabi also so C1 is zero. And an example is the quintic trifold. Uh, and so this means that uh, these numbers here are, uh, are always defined. And in particular, it makes sense to put them in a generating function and we'll do this. And this is called the partition function of the gromov witten theory. So here we have one, one number for each genus and each curve class beta, and we use a variable u to keep track of the genus and the variable z to keep track of the, the curve class. And for some reason, we take the exponential. So, okay, th this was the, the, the map side and I want now to describe what the equation side is. And this is slightly more recent. Um, so it, it was, uh, well, the first version of it was defined by Donaldson and Thomas. And it uses the, this modelized space of subschemes, which is basically a, a Hilbert scheme. So we take the modelized space of subschemes of dimension at most one with a certain curve class and with, with a certain Euler characteristic. So again, when X is a trifold, it admits a virtual fundamental class. So in general, this is always, this modelized space is always defined, but for high dimension, we don't have a virtual fundamental class, which is kind of unpleasant, but that's life. If moreover X is also calabi then the expected dimension as happened in the gromov witten theory uh, is zero. And so again, we can define some, some numerical invariance. And we use this notation. Now we, instead of a genus and the curve class beta, we have uh, another characteristic N and the curve class beta as well. So here is some, some picture of what a one dimensional scheme looks like. I mean, it can be, a lot of things can happen. So we can have very singular curves. We may have some embedded points. We may have some uh, reducedness. Um, and also we may have some, some points wandering around X. So yeah, and the, for some reason, these pictures always remind me of mirror paintings. So here is a mirror painting. Maybe you will disagree that they look like, but uh, you know, for me, for me, they re always remind me. And so this issue with the free points, so this, this free points that are here that are not uh, connected to, to, the, to curves, uh, is, is kind of unpleasant. First, because it makes the moduli spaces always very complicated. They're at least as complicated as the moduli, as uh, the Hilbert scheme of points. Um, and, and also because somehow they are contributing to, to our invariants. We would like just to count uh, curves and not count points. And so we can remove this contribution in a kind of artificial way by defining the generating function, by defining the partition function as this generating function, which is okay, it's normal. Now, instead of a variable u to keep track of the genus, we have this variable q to keep track of the Euler characteristic. But then we divide by the degree zero contributions, which kind of removes the, the point contributions. And actually there is a, a beautiful formula for this uh, degree zero contribution as an infinite product. Okay, but more recently, uh, around 10 years ago, uh, uh, Pandari Pan and Thomas proposed uh, an alternative to DT theory that kind of deals with these three points in a nicer way. And so to explain what a stable pair is, uh, well, we think first of uh, these curves in DT theory as a surjection from the structure shift to the of x to the structure shift of the of the curve, and now stable pairs are kind of similar. They are uh, a shift f together with some map from the structure shift to f. But now we require f to be pure one dimensional instead of just one dimensional, and this basically removes the free points. But in exchange, we have to give something, and what we give is. Instead of saying that uh, the map is surjective, we ask the co for the co-kernel to have dimension zero. And okay, as before, we denote now by Pn x beta this model I space. So the way you should think of, uh, of stable pairs is um, has curves with, cert with some marked points in, in them. So in particular, if C is a smooth curve, then the stable pairs that are supported on C are exactly of this form. So they are basically uh, 
they are basically given by a smooth curve and some effective divisor on C, which is basically a bunch of points on C. And okay, as we did for DT theory, we can define uh, the PT invariant and we can define the, the partition function. And now since we don't have these uh, points wandering around, uh, we don't have to normalize the, the partition function. And so a striking result about uh, stable pairs is that uh, if you fix a curve class and uh, you sum over the, you put in a generating function with the summing over the Euler characteristic, you will always get um, the lower rank expansion of some rational function. Okay, as, I'm, as I've been kind of hinting, all these theories are actually equivalent. So the DT and PT equivalence is well known since 2016 by Bridgeland. Uh, with a lot of other people contributing some ideas to it. Um, and it's well known. And it can be very simply stated in just saying that these two generate these two partition functions are the same. Here, recall that the, the DT partition function has the normalization. Well, while this is true, the equivalence with Chroma Witten is more complicated and not known. But the conjecture is the following: the conjecture says that. Uh, the two generating series agree, but only after we perform this change of variables. So recall this was defined with a variable u keeping track of the genus, and this was defined with a variable q keeping track of the other characteristic, and we have to make this change of variables so that the two of them agree. But okay, this is still conjectural. But even if it's conjectural, it opens a very interesting direction that we can use the equation side to, to study the map side. And each of, it, each of the sides has some advantages uh, with respect to the other. For example, Graham Witten theory is defined in every dimension. Uh, it's it can be defined for any symplectic manifold. And also it's defined over the model I of curves, which sometimes is useful. On the other hand, stable pairs have this rationality property. They are a priori in integers. They have no multiple cover contributions. In general, they are more computable. Uh, and finally, we have these very nice wall crossing techniques uh, that allow us to prove uh, some results. For example, the, the rationality and the DTPT correspondence is proven like this. And so, well, you see that the list for stable pairs is, is bigger because I'm biased uh, towards them. Uh, but indeed, stable pairs can be very useful and, and they've been very useful in proving results about Chromovitan theory. So here are here are some, some results, which I don't want to go into detail, but let me just say a few words about um, a more recent result that's actually so recent that's not, uh, not yet uh, available. Uh, so this is a result by myself and uh, Tim Bulls, who, who is my uh, academic brother. So let's take Calabi out trifold and let's, that contains some, some smooth divisor E, which is isomorphic to a copy to, to, to the product of two P1s. And let's take B to be the curve class of one of these P1s. Uh, okay, and we have some technical assumption. Uh, then the theorem is the following. So let's take a fixed uh, curve class, fixed genus, and let's put the Gromov-Witten invariance in a generating function where uh, we're taking the curve class to be beta plus a multiple of B. And then the claim is that uh, this guy is also uh, an expansion of, a ration, of some rational function that satisfies some kind of symmetry. And you see that while this is for Gromovitan theory, it's very similar in spirit to the rationality of uh, I claimed for stable pairs. So th this was suggested by, by, by some physics paper, uh, this kind of symmetry. Well, uh, maybe not in this generality, but in some cases. Uh, and indeed, our, our proof goes through the model of stable pairs. And this statement is a consequence of, uh, of the following claim on stable pairs. So we claim that if we put in a generating function, uh, stable pairs invariance, where now we have two, two variables, a variable Q to keep track of uh, the other characteristic as before, and the variable capital Q that keeps track of the multiple of B. Then, the, and okay, and the, as we did for DT theory, we have some kind of normalization. And then the claim is that this is the expansion of a rational function uh, in two variables that also satisfies some kind of symmetry. And uh, 
Well, the Gromov Witten statement is a consequence of this and the, and the correspondence. Um, and so I, I just want to finish by, by remarking that this symmetry, the high level explanation for this symmetry is the existence of a certain automorphism in the derived category, which is written here. And this is kind of uh, remarkable because if you look at the definition of Gromov Witten theory, well, there is nothing that would make you believe that uh, an automorphism of the derived category could constrain the Gromov Witten invariance. But under the correspondence with with the PT theory, this is clear because the PT invariants are defined inside the, the derived category. So it makes a, so from the perspective of the correspondence, it makes a lot of sense that um, that some some symmetry in the derived category constrains all the enumerative ge geometry of X. And okay, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I. Don't see any question. Let me check. Uh, no. So, if someone has some question, please ask now. Um, so, meanwhile, I might have uh, just uh, maybe a vague question. So, you said this, there is this conjecture on the equality of the three theories. Uh, yes. Uh, so, how far is that from? Uh, being uh, maybe, I don't know, is it far being proved or is that? I mean, it's proven, in, uh, it's proven in a lot of cases. There are some techniques that, uh, yeah. like if you have some, you know, th there, there is some, some path of ideas that allow to prove this for a lot of geometries. Um, Mm -hmm. using some degeneration techniques and the uh, toric tech for example this is known for for toric varieties it's known uh, sorry you said it's known or? yes yes it's known for toric varieties and you there are some tricks to for example prove things in uh, hypersurfaces of toric varieties but it's not known in that generality but maybe maybe it could be proven but to, to give a general proof it would require some new idea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, so yeah, we have here a, a question by Anna Anna Margarida Melo. Could the conjecture uh, equivalence be used to define PT invariance for more general X? Or yeah, yeah, for for sure. I mean, you can just define them formally. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, well, actually. Well, so by more general, oh, so if by more general X, you mean higher dimension? I guess so. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, I, think, I think that not really. Um, mm. So I think there is some, some work on, on this, like in dim dimension four and five. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's not really PT invariance, but some, some related PT invariance. Some some things related, but yeah, for higher dimension, it's not, for example, it's not clear in higher dimension that uh, so this this conjecture together with the PT rationality implies that the Gromov-Witten theory uh, is um, you know it's rational in the variable e to the iu, and I, I think that's not true in in higher dimension. So yeah. Uh, I think that the answer is no, or at least there's not much hope for that. All right. Okay. Uh, so I don't see any further questions. So thank you again to Miguel. And uh, let's move on straight away uh, to the next uh, speaker, who is Chaim. Jaim Silva, so Jaim, please. Okay, great, you're sharing your screen. So Jaim Silva from uh, Instituto Superior de Engenharia de Lisboa, who is going to talk about motives of character varieties. So Jaim, it's your... Thank you, Andre. Let me start by thanking SPM, for organizing this meeting, and you in particular for inviting me to be a part of it. 
Okay, so today I'll talk about motifs of character varieties. Um, so I'll start in a very general place. Okay, so as probably all of you know, algebraic varieties are spaces that, loosely speaking, can be thought of as being locally given by common solutions of solutions of polynomial equations. Uh, so, for instance, if I think about the solution sets to such equations in R, I can get things such as a sphere or a torus, just to give two examples. But actually, I want to think about these types of spaces over any given field. So, for instance, rational numbers, the complex numbers, or finite fields. And actually, these last two examples will be the one I will be more focused in during this lecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my work on this field is concerned with calculation of algebraic cohomological invariants that in particular could defy some uh, information on the shape of these types of objects. So the simplest example I could give you is one that every one of you is familiar with, that is the other characteristic, that when I have a compact surface in R3 is just given by the alternate sum of the number of faces of a given triangulation. But it can also be calculated by two minus two times its genus that are its number of holes. So it's a number that gives us some information on the shape of the object. And actually we can calculate by using cohomology, the other characteristic to much more general space than just this. And so cohomology, very, very briefly, are vector spaces that were assigned to topological spaces that are due to homology. So in some sense, they codify the number of K holes on a space of holes of a given dimension. And I calcu can calculate their other characteristic by the ultimate sum of the dimensions of the, the, the cohomology vector spaces. <clears throat> and so today related to this mainly I want to talk central character would be maybe said to be the real conjectures uh, but first let me just give you a, a motivating example so in a very famous problem uh, Fermat's last theorem that says that this equation when n, n is bigger or equal than 3 has no non trivial solutions over the integers and actually one of well, this has been proven as we all know but uh, one of the biggest one of big developments in, in, the, in the attempt to, to produce a result was a conjecture by Mordell that was later proven by Faultings that when n is bigger or equal than four, if I think of this equation not over the integers but over the complex numbers, it is an algebraic variety and it has genus greater or equal than one. And because of it, it has only a finite number of rational points. And so over the integer, it has at most a finite number of solutions. So, but this was just an example of application of these types of ideas. But as I said, what I really want to talk about are the veil conjectures, although I'll only mention one of them. Okay, so the veil conjectures were conjectures over smooth projective. For those that, of, uh, of you that don't know what this means, think of it as being compact, varieties defined over finite fields and are conjectures that are related with this function that is a function that uh, codifies in an appropriate way the number of points of these varieties over a finite field and its finite dimensional extensions. And so the vowel conjectures all concern this function and one of them has, is that this is a special type of rational function. But in particular, I want to talk about the fact that one of the reasons that motivated Veil to make this conjecture is the fact that you realize that there were some similarities between 
counting points of varieties or finite fields and their cohomology over the complex numbers. Namely, we believe that there should exist a cohomology theory for varieties over finite fields that was connected to, to its number of points and that should satisfy similar properties to the usual cohomology for complex varieties. So in particular, the left jet fixed point formula, Poincaré duality, connected exomorphism, etc. And the vial conjectures should be a consequence of the existence of such cohomology theory. Well, the vial conjectures the, the conject have been proved. The, the last one was in 1975 by Dolin. And indeed, most of them were proven by the existence of such a cohomology theory, a Ladi cohomology theory. But what I actually want to talk about is an attempted proof that has not been completed yet and may even not be possible to complete since in particular it, it depends on the standard conjecture for algebraic cycles. That was the proof that was uh, dreamed of to borrow uh, a term by Mound, by Grotendieck. So what was this theory? The fact is that Grotendieck believed that for algebraic varieties, there should exist such a thing as a universal cohomology theory. So a cohomology theory where all appropriate algebraic cohomology theories should be qualified. So the thing is that, uh, so I try to more or less explain in this diagram. So we should have a way to enlarge the category of algebraic varieties to a much better behaved category, but much larger as well. Where if I knew the representative of a variety in this category, I will know, I will knew any appropriate cohomology theory to meet. In particular, I will be able to simultaneously deduce facts about complex cohomology or cohomology for varieties or of finite fields just for, by the properties that this category was supposed to satisfy. But as I told you, this project has not been finished yet, but the idea had striking applications in mathematics. And indeed, nowadays, uh, motivic theory exists in many ways, shapes, and forms. But I just want to talk today about its simplest form. So uh, a, a certain way to codify the simplest algebraic invariant, algebraic cohomological invariants, those that are additive to locally closed certifications. So for instance, two I talked about today, the other characteristic and counting points are such invariants. So if I certify a space, I can calculate the other characteristics of the pieces and the one of the bigger space is just given by the sum and the same for counting points for varieties over finite fields. And indeed to do this, well, the, the construction of such a thing is, is strikingly simple. What we do is we pick the category of varieties, we pick its isomorphism, its isomorphism classes, we pick the free abelian group generated by them, and then we caution it by the excision relation, which means that if I can write a variety as a disjoint union of some other varieties, then in this ring, I want to identify the bigger piece with the sum of the smaller ones. So as such, this ring codifies any invariant that helps me, satisfies the, the excision relation. So to give you an example, for instance, the, the, the projective space, I can also always write it as a gent union 
of linear spaces of smaller or equal dimension, and as such, in a protonic ring of varieties, it satisfies this equation. And this is valid for any field, right? So this is giving me some cohomological information valid over any field. OK, so I'm going to skip this part because uh, I don't have much time. But it's just to point the fact that, I mean, this ring, it codifies a lot of inform information in, the, in, in algebraic geometry. But because algebraic geometry is quite rigid. In other contexts, this is a very simple ring. But in, in this one, no. The Grotenic ring of varieties is actually a very complicated ring. There are many things about it that we still don't know. And it codifies a lot of important, important information. So as I said, it codifies any type of other characteristic, not just the one corresponding to all geometric in, uh, intuition. Uh, it codifies the number of irreducible components over finite fields, as I also said, the number of points. And over the complex numbers, that is the case that interests me the most. It has also codified some important information about mix of structure that if I have time, I'll talk about a, a, a bit more about this later. And if the variety happens to be smooth projective, once again, you can think of so much as being compact it actually gives us the, the cohomology. So in here, what I want to talk about is that uh, some significant information on character varieties. So character varieties can be given by two ingredients. On the one hand, we start with a continuous group, a complex relative group. For those of you that don't know what reductive means, you can think of it as a group of matrices. It's more general than that. But uh, stay that with the example in mind. And gamma, a finitely presented group. Then I define a character variety by a quotient on the following space. So I start the space of group homomorphisms from gamma to G. As gamma is finitely presented, this is an e, and G is an algebraic variety. This is an algebraic variety as well. And then I quotient it by the conjugation national G. Well, with the naive quotient, this is not a well-defined uh, geometrical space. So I have to correct it and take an appropriate quotient in algebraic geometry, the GIT quotient that uh, <coughs> yeah, that corrects the fact that this is not a, a well-defined geometrical quotient. And in here, I want to talk about my work when gamma is a free abelian group. In this case, when gamma is a free abelian group, the space of representations can be identified with the R tuples of matrix of elements in G that commute. And then we take the action of the conjugation. So in particular, it has some information on the space of putting tuples on a complexity group. And in, in my thesis, uh, me and my advisor, Carl Trugentino, obtain a description of the mix of structure of these spaces for any complex relative group. But today, I'm just going to talk about one particular group, the general linear group. In particular, because in this case, uh, one can quite easily obtain an isomorphism between this character variety and the symmetric products of C star, so C minus a point to the power R. And because of this description, I can make a quite easy connection between it and the vial set function. Why? Well, if you recall the vial set function, I said to you that it was a way of codifying the number of points of a variety defined of a finite field, and the number of points, yes, and also in its extensions. But using a result of Hilbert, I can actually rewrite it, it in this way. So in a different power series that codifies the number of points of the symmetric products of the beginning variety. And uh, this in particular led 
Kaplanov to define a similar function, but in the Grotten degree over this. So a power series that codifies the representatives of symmetric products of varieties in the grotten degree of varieties. And so if you remember, one of the vital conjectures was the fact that this function was rational. So one might wonder, is a Kapranov veil motif that a function rational? But actually, actually Larson and Lons in 2004 proved that this is not so, and actually gave an example over the complex numbers where this is not rational. But one of the reasons why we, we could think it was is because, I mean, if you compose these with counting points, with the counting point functions, we recover the, the vials at the function. And there are other reasons to think it, it could be rational, but I won't cover them here. And, but as I said, it is not. And, But uh, me and Carlos Florentino recently proved that for a special type of varieties, this is indeed rational. So varieties whose representative in the grotten degree of varieties is a, is a polynomial in the line. In this case, this function is indeed rational and its coefficients are also polynomials in the line. So because of that, then I know that the representative of our character variety in GLN are, since they are given by symmetric portraits, they are also polynomials in L. And we can we could use our format for the e polynomial that is a polynomial to define some information on the mix of structure that is also an additive invariant to also to actually calculate its representative in the Grotnik group of ring of varieties by this formula that in particular is a formula that depends on the partitions of n. In here, this is the set of operations of n and is n denotes the partition of n with a parts of size i. Andre, I'm over my time, aren't I? Uh, you have... Sorry, you, you can, I mean, one, one, one more minute? <laughs> one more minute? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay just to mention that more recently, uh, I won't say what, what, they, what, what those are, but me, Carlos, and also Sean, Sean Lawton actually we managed to obtain the mixed such polynomial. That is a polynomial that codifies the dimensions of the mixed such pieces for the representation space for free Boolean groups. That in this case coincides with a space that is very easy to define, right? The space of arc moving tuples in a group. And I'll finish by yeah by showing you this result. Okay. Was less than a minute. <laughs> okay, thank you, Zayn. Thank you. So, any questions? Let me check if there are some questions to Zayn. No questions. Until I have a question. If okay, I may. So, Zayn, so we heard this morning in Consolidated Waters talk about these motivic measures. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to ask a question, which is probably extremely naive, but so your results on these character varieties, does that somehow point the way of to saying that there might be some motivic measure defined for suitable class of character varieties that can uh, reproduce this kind of result? Or, or is this a question that simply makes no sense at all? <laughs> so you were asking if there are some motivic measure yeah, and so it's behind this, I mean, uh, he, in, in the talk we saw this morning, there was a special class of varieties for which he managed to construct this motivic measure, and then in the end it produces some kind of results like formulas for point variants. I don't know, this is perhaps an incredibly vague and question that shows my ignorance of the stuff, but anyway. No, 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 I mean, it is, it's interesting, but... The problem is that I, I think I cannot give you an interesting answer. I, I, I don't know, Peter. <laughs> okay, so I have a, just a, a vague question also, something which always I get confused with it. So you said, so two varieties which have the same motive. So the motive is it true that the motive of, vari of variety recovers the Hodge structure or not? What motive? 
If you have two varieties, this motive, the graph yeah, yeah, varieties, the varieties for, a fine, for a fine varieties, no, it's not true. For even projective if varieties, have, or for smooth and projective varieties, it's true. But even even better than that. I mean, you can make that a bit better, but yes, but but in particular for smooth projective varieties, definitely yes. Yeah. Okay, but then the problem is the mixed odd structure. Are you saying? That? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's it's the same problem as as you have in the polynomial right? You can get things that get cancelled out. Okay, all right. But I mean, this is in the Cartonic window variety, right? I mean, there are motives sure, that, sure. that uh, we I allow mean, you to, yeah, to yeah, recover yeah. the mixed out structure. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just not these ones. Yeah, yeah, I was mentioning this one. And and so you also computed these uh, classes for other groups, right? For yeah. Uh, which ones? Symplectic and for yeah for the classical ones for so for the symplectic for the for uh, orthogonal uh, the special orthogonal yeah. and so do you see but so not in the Grothendieck window varieties in, in in other types of motifs but do you see some so the symplectic group and uh, it's Langlands dual to the orthogonal group of uh, odd rank right mm -hmm. do you see any kind of uh, the duality on the formulas that you get, or some kind of equality, or yeah, there is an equality in that one. Yeah. All right, okay, okay. So, any other questions? No. If not, then we are a little bit behind time. So let's move on to the next speaker. And thank you, Jaime, again. Thank you. Uh, so now, uh, Carlos, we have. Okay, he's sharing already. Carlos Rito from Universidade de Trasmontes e Alto Douro and Universidade de Porto. He's going to talk about <laughs> Z2 Godot surfaces. Okay, Carlos. Okay, so thank you very much, Andre and SPM. Uh, I'm not seeing myself. Ah, okay, I'm here. Okay, so uh, let me start by saying that this is joint work with Eduardo Dias. Um, so I have to be very fast. So we start with a, a, a smooth, complex algebraic surface of general type. About this, I, I, I can only say that the, there is a, a classification of surfaces and some surfaces are of special type, uh, for example, K3 and the rational surfaces and others. And, uh, but most of the surfaces are of general type. Uh, surfaces of general type are very difficult to classify. Uh, so there, there are a lot of open problems involving surfaces of general type. We have the, the, some numerical invariants, which are topological invariants. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't have time to read the definitions. So we have the, the suffix section of economical divisor. We know that for surfaces of general type, it's, uh, it, it, it is at most one. The geometric genus and the irregularity that are no negative and the holomorphic other characteristic. Uh, Given if you fix the, 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 the invariants, it has been proven that there exists some uh, modelized space that is a quasi projective variety. And the goal is to study these modelized spaces. Of course, that this can be very hard. And uh, a lot of times uh, we are very far from understanding the, the, the modelized space. And in fact, a lot of times we, we, we even don't know if the modelized space is empty or not. So sometimes just to give an example in the modelized space is, 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 is already very good. Um, so, so surfaces with, with the, the small possible invariants are surfaces with the geometric genus and the irregularity equal to zero and k square equal to one. And of course, that since we cannot uh, 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 obtain a, 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 a good, satisfactory uh, uh, results for, for other invariants, 
at least for this first case, we we would like to 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 have a, a full classification. And it is somewhat, somehow frustrating that even in this case, uh, the, the full classification does not exist yet. Uh, so the first example of a surface with these invariants was given in 31 by Godot. It's just, uh, it, it takes a kinetic surface in, in projective space P3 uh, with some free action of the group Z5. And this is a surface with these invariants. Then, so after that, surfaces with these invariants are, are colored numerical Godot surfaces, or so, so sometimes only just Godot surfaces. And by result of Miyok, I think, and, and, and maybe Manswit also, we know that the torsion groups for Godot surfaces uh, are cyclic with order at most five. Uh, let me just say that the, the here, the, the topological fundamental group can be equal to the torsion group or bigger. Then my Miles Reed constructed the modelized space for the cases n equal to five, four, and three. And it was proven that in this case, also the topological fundamental group is Z5, Z4, and Z3. And moreover, the, the modelized space is irreducible of dimension eight. Then there is a conjecture for the case n equal two that the modelized space should also be irreducible of dimension eight. For the case n equal one, uh, no one knows. Uh, I, I, I think that there is no, no, no conjecture. The case n equal one is, 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 is very difficult. Uh, Miles with uh, uh, Madrid and others. I, I will not give the reference because a lot of people work on on other surfaces, so I, I can can't refer to to all of them. So I refer only to to Madrid. It he tried to to compute the modelized space for the case n equal two, and but but at that time he said that uh, he had an idea, but the computers were not. Uh, sufficiently fast for, for his idea. So in, in collaboration with Eduard Dias, we have classified the case n equal to that we call Z2 Godot surfaces. We have computed equations for all the surfaces and we have shown that in this case, the conjecture is true, the modelized space is also irreducible of dimension eight. In fact, we have, we consider so since the torsion is Z2, we can take N et al double, double covering. So we have another surface that is a, a double covering of the Godot surface. And uh, we have computed the equations for these coverings, for these uh, double et al coverings. And once we have these equations, of course, that in each case, we can compute to the corresponding Godot surface. Okay, so now our, our work follows follows the, the, the paper of Katanez and the Bath. In fact, we finish what they, they started. Okay, so I will I will briefly explain some of their work and I will give an idea of what we have done. So so S is the et al double covering of a double cover of a Z2 Godot and we call so we have an evolution sigma and so the invariants of S are k equal to, k square equal to, and of course the, the quotient by the evolution is the Godot surface. Um, so we, 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 we will look to these surfaces S and we want to compute all of them. So the generators of the canonical, so this, the reference for this here is, is the paper of Katanez Bach. They give the generators of the canonical ring and and the, the, these signs minus and plus uh, denote that these variables are invariant or anti-invariant for the for the, the Godot evolution. What this means here is that is that we hope so we 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 have here a weighted projective space so with these degrees and we hope to find equations in this weighted projective space for all the surfaces. Okay. 
Now, they have shown that the canonical curve, so the PG of S is one, so there exists exactly one effective canonical curve. They show that the canonical curve is hyperelytic. Uh, the, this, this number two is very important. The bicanonical map, which is the map given by the bicanonical system, is, by rational, is a birational morphism onto an optic in P3, which means that we can send, there is a, a uh, degree one map that sends the surface onto a, a, a surface of the degree eight in P3. Uh, this surface is not normal, is uh, singular in dimension one. Nevertheless, if we have this, this surface in P3, it is sufficient for our purposes. Then we can recover the other surface. And they show that this optic is the, the determinant of some matrix that we call alpha of the following type. <clears throat> so the surface is, is like this. So G is of degree three in these variables. The key I and the AIJ are of degrees two and one, also in these variables. And Q is, is a quadric. So the, this quadric, when, when we take X equals zero, we obtain a, a, a conic in P3, which is the, the image so a conic contained in that optic, that is the determinant. The optic is the determinant of this matrix. And when we take X equals zero, this, this conic is the image of the, the canonical curve. And again, plus and minus means invariant and anti-invariant. So our goal is to describe exactly all the possibilities for this uh, matrix here because if we have this matrix, we have everything. But this matrix depends on G and the, the ki, and these depend on some parameters, and we need to, to, to study this. And very important is that this matrix satisfies this rank condition, they call the rank condition. So we take the, the, the cofactor, which is the determinant of the matrix, the, the cofactors from a linear algebra. We, we, you, we remove the, 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 the row and the column and we take the, the determinant. So the cofactors must satisfy this. So here we have the cofactors corresponding to the first line of the matrix. And this rank condition says that all cofactors can be written using these cofactors from the first line. And very importantly, they show that whenever we have a matrix, as the one uh, shown before, a matrix like this, satisfying this rank condition, then we can uh, obtain the, the, the initial surface, with the, which is the, the double covering of the Godel surface. Okay? So, again, we have this matrix. The determinant of this matrix is an optic in P3 that is by rational to our original surface. And we have this rank condition. And this rank condition determines everything. So our goal is to compute this, this matrix. So I recall G and the key, this QI uh, depend on some variables, or uh, sorry, on some parameters. Okay, so our first result, we consider X equal to zero. This corresponds to study, not the, the, the surface, but looking only to the canonical curve of the surface. So when X equals zero, we obtain a zeros here in this line and zeros here. And so the, 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 the matrix becomes simpler and we can show that in fact, in this case, the matrix can be written like this, okay? Uh, here, we only use rank condition and linear algebra, okay? We do a de detailed study with using only rank condition and linear algebra. And we have this result. And then after this, we extend this matrix to the case where X is not zero. And here, we only use linear algebra uh very detailed study that allow us to give this theory okay so the matrix can be written like this and we have here 
I'm introducing a new variable, y4, just because it's otherwise uh, I would have to give several different uh, uh, matrices. And in introducing this variable, I can give several cases in this compact form. Okay, so here we have six cases one, two, three. But this, this parameter C here can be one or zero. So we have six cases that we, we need to, to study. The main case is this one that we call, so we call the case alpha one with C equal to one. So this will give uh, a component in the model life space, a component of dimension eight. The other cases will give components of dimension smaller than eight, seven uh, or six. <clears throat> So our goal is to compute the matrix, which means to compute these polynomials. These polynomials depend on 22 parameters and with the parameter that we call D, so this depend on 23 parameters. So the matrix depends on 23 parameters. So since we ex expect to find a, a space of dimension eight, somehow we have to eliminate parameters in order to finish with only eight parameters, okay? So eight is the expected dimension for, for, for the model space. And, and in fact, we, we show that it is, it is eight. So we have the run condition. So these are the, co the cofactors coming from the matrix. The matrix depend on 23 parameters, okay? So this beta ij depend on 23 parameters, but the run condition says that these polynomials here, l, i, j, k, must exist. So we take this in the more, most possible general form. So we put parameters there, and in the total, we have a lot of these polynomials. So in, in the total, they depend on 371 parameters. Okay, so our goal is to compute the parameters that appear in the matrix such that these polynomials are identically zero, which means that their coefficients must vanish. Okay, in the end, we have a huge system. So now the new polynomials are the coefficients that appear here, they have to be zero. And so we have a, 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 a lot of these polynomials. 876, and they depend on almost 400 uh, parameters, okay? So this is uh, for the computer. When we put this in the computer, nothing happens because we don't have a, a software that can deal with this. So we need to figure out a way to, to, to solve this, this system of uh, polynomials. So, here I'm recalling what I want to do. I want to eliminate all the Ri and some of the Pi because, so the Pi are the parameters that appear in the matrix. We have 23, but we know that we will finish with, we want to finish with around eight, which is what it is expected. So we want to eliminate some. And here we don't have the Ri, which are the, the parameters that appear here in this L, E, J, K. So we want to eliminate all these RR, okay? So eliminate all these and some of the others. These ones that I appear with the degree one, which is good, but nevertheless, if we try some linear elimination, it, it doesn't work. So we decided to write our own linear elimination. So, and the idea is uh, let's write something that works as if we do it by hand. So by hand, what do you do? You, you look to, to some, you have a lot of equations and you look to, you will, for example, you look to one equation and you find R1 and R1 is the only one of the, of the Ri that is there. And you have another equation with a lot of Ri there. So you choose the simpler one. You want the ones where some of these appears isolated and is the only one. And you start using this and you eliminate using this equation, okay? So let me use this, this notation. This is the number of, of, 
number of Ri means the number that appear isolated in that equation. So uh, by hand, you, you will start with the, the equations where this number is one. So this is the first step. Eliminate using only the equations where this number is one. Okay, and after eliminating, you obtain new equations and you check if these new equations, some of these new equations can be simpler and you check if some of these, uh, for some of these, this number is one or even zero and you, you repeat. When this is no longer possible, you look to equations where this number is two. And again, you eliminate and then you check if some equations are simpler and simplify and you repeat and you continue like this. And this algorithm uh, is not complicated and uh, it works very well. Uh, and if in fact is fast. So in, 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 in some ship computer, it says something like uh, less than two minutes. In my new computer that is fast, it, it, it takes 30 seconds. So, so it worked very well. And we were able to, to, to compute the matrix. And then we look to the matrix and then we see a problem. A lot of parameters appear and we cannot get rid of these parameters uh, using the, the algorithm. This is not in fact a problem because we can show that, so the equations that we get in the end, the ones of, the, of degree at most five depend only on the parameters that appear in the, in the matrix. And then these can be used to eliminate all the RI that still remain. Why? Because we see that the RI, the RI appear like this, where this, this, this polynomial here is is in this, this ideal given by these equations, okay? So because of this, we can assume that all the Ri are zero and we are done. We obtain the solution and we, uh, in the main case, so the matrix, to see the matrix, this matrix, we need to compute G and Ki. And in this case, so the main case is this case here, J equal to one we the polynomials are surprisingly simple so the matrix is is given by this in the other cases we also so so in this case we end up with a matrix that depends on nine parameters but we can show that these nine parameters uh, define a, a weighted projective space of dimension eight okay so we have a component um, parameterized by, by a space of dimension eight. For the other cases, we, we obtain components of dimension seven or six. And since it is known that uh, the local moduli should be at least eight, this means that these cases of dimension smaller than eight must be contained in the closure of this uh, uh, bigger case of dimension eight. Then finally, since there exists one God of surface with topological fundamental group set two, and since our space is, is irreducible, and we, we, we conclude that the, the topological fundamental group must be, must be Z2. So let me see. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I still have time, maybe yeah, not. Yeah, I think you're basically out of time. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, I stop here. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Thanks. Uh, so, any questions or comments in the chat or in the no? So, so Carlos, if you could very quickly. So, I remember that when you were talking about this, you also. I mean, while we we talked. We were talking also by these uh, fake projective planes uh, related to this. Uh, ah, okay. Um, mm. This is because when I started uh, looking to these surfaces, uh, I wasn't expecting to find a, a full classification. 
uh, because I, well, this is this is a, a difficult problem. I was interested in finding an explicit construction of a fake projective plane, which was until very very recently, which was one of the the biggest open problems in the theory of algebraic surfaces. There was more or less a kind of a race. A lot of people was trying to find an explicit construction of such a surface, and and I wanted to find one in the following way. By the classification, uh, which is given by, by the, the computation of their fundamental groups, uh, it is known that there is some fake projective plane with a quotient that is a Z2 goto, so one of these godos, with a, a certain, with four cusp singularities. Mm -hmm. So what, what I thought was, if I can put my hands on the equations of a eight dimensional component, there is a, a big pro uh, probability that this Godot lives there. And I, if I can use uh, computational tools to find this Godot surface, then I, I have a, an explicit construction of a fake projective plane. So this was my interest. Um, Meanwhile, Kuhn and Borisov found the, the equations for this, uh, for this fake project, projective plane that I'm talking about. And then wh when, I, when I finished uh, my, my computations, I could see uh, that in fact, uh, the Godot surface that comes from their computations, in fact, as expected, lives in my in, in our family so so i was able to to identify the, the the equations now the question is imagine they they didn't uh, uh, have found the, the the fake projective plane would i be able using my idea would i be able to 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 find it i don't know uh, the computations would be difficult but Maybe, maybe, but okay. I didn't have the opportunity to, to try. All right, great. Okay, thank you. No uh, other questions, I think. So thank you, Carlos, again. And without delay, we are 12 minutes behind schedule. So uh, getting great. So, but I think so. Mm, now we can go to our last speaker, our plenary speaker of this Algebraic Geometry session, Peter Gotten from Universidad de Porto. Thank you, Peter. He's going to talk about geometric structures and Higgs bundles. So let me unmute. So thank you very much, Andre, for inviting me to speak here. It's a great pleasure. Um, and um, if anybody has questions along the way, just feel free to stop me and uh, and ask, and um, and I'll try to answer to the best of, of my ability. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about, um, my title is Geometric Structures and Higgs Bundles. I'll talk a little bit in general terms, and then uh, the main new results I'm going to talk about are going to be based on a joint work with Steve Bradlow, Brian Collier, uh, Oscar Castillo Prada, and, and Andre. Um, Okay, so what's the plan? Um, my plan is to uh, first talk a little bit in generality about Higgs bundles, the non-abelian host theorem and character varieties, and uh, I'll uh, then take the point of view, since this is an algebraic geometry session, I'll start with this algebraic geometry side and, and try to say a little bit about what you might try to do in terms of understanding these moduli spaces of Higgs bundles, in particular their connected components. Um, so this is this exotic components bit. And then uh, this work I was alluding to uh, is, is about how you can find a general theoretic mechanism for actually uh, building, um, in some sense, unexpected connected components of the expandable moduli spaces. Um, and then finally, I'm going to uh, uh, come to the other side, to the, um, the character variety side, and, and explain what this has to do briefly what this has to do with uh, with uh, um, 
some some geometric properties of, uh, of representations of surface groups. So this in the end, uh, this relation of course uh, relies on the on the non-abelian Hodge theorem. So that's the general plan. So let me try to get on with it. So um, uh, here's my here's my notation. So uh, take some uh, let's see some complex reductively group. Um, so um, if you want. Uh, you might just think of uh, the SLNC, for instance. Um, then we take some real form. So for instance, SLNR given by some uh, complex antilinear involution whose fixed points um, are this real group. Um, then um, if we want to describe this in, in complex terms, we take the Lie algebra of the complex group and uh, we compose our real form here with the compact real form. And we get a C linear uh, involution of the Lie algebra, uh, which then uh, has a plus one eigenspace and minus one eigenspace. And this gives you the so called Cartanti composition of the, of the Lie algebra. Um, so, in particular, this part will be the complexification of the maximal compact, uh, which will act via the adjoint representation of the Lie algebra. And, um, and uh, it respects the splitting. So, so this uh, complement to the compact piece is in particular a representation, so-called isotropic representation of the, of the complexification of the maximal compact. So that should have been visible, I guess. Okay, so um, just a quick example. Uh, so what I was saying before, we can look at the conjugation, which gives us the um, special linear group um, compact real structure is taking the conjugate transpose and then this Cartan involution is just taking the transpose so the Lie algebra of uh, of SLNC uh, decomposes as um, a skew symmetric matrices uh, uh, plus uh, symmetric matrices and, and the isotropy representation is just um, conjugation action of the of the orthogonal matrices on the on the symmetric ones. Okay so that's like the Lie theoretic bit. So now let's do some uh, complex or some algebraic geometry. So I'll take um, a Riemann surface or, or um, smooth algebraic curve of the complex numbers, um, projective curve. Uh, I'll call it X, genus at least two, and I'll call the canonical bundle. So the holomorphic cotangent bundle I'll note by K. Um, all right, so out of all this data, we can build um, Higgs bundles for GR. Uh, this uh, language will hopefully become clear in a minute when we get to the non abelian hot theorem. but for now, let's just define these objects. So these Higgs bundles are pairs where um, uh, we have EH as a holomorphic or principal bundle um, with a structure group H. Um, this, this complexification of the maximal compact. And then the second uh, piece of information is a Higgs field, which is a, a section, uh, a section of what? So uh, remember that we have this isotropic representation of H on, uh, on the M piece of the carton decomposition. So we can take the associated bundles uh, with fibers M to E, uh, and then we take uh, basically a holomorphic one form with, uh, with values in this bundle and that's the Higgs field. Okay, so the, the first main example is like the canonical example of what is a Higgs bundle is just for the general linear group. Uh, and the Higgs bundle is then just a right in holomorphic vector bundle uh, together with uh, an endomorphism valued one form phi. So this is the Higgs, Higgs vector bundle. So it's the first example. Uh, let me give you a second one. Uh, so let me make this visible. Um, so I just copied the definition. Okay, so this is what was there already. Uh, now let's uh, find an example where the group is a bit more interesting. In particular, it's really a, a, a real group, not just a complex group viewed as a real group. Um, the maximal compact of, of uh, SL2R is SO2 and its complexification, and then just a copy of C star, uh, which we view. Uh, in this way as these diagonal matrices. So this corresponds to taking the quadratic uh, form um, of diagonal shape. 
And then the, the isotropic representation uh, corresponds to matrices of, of this form, uh, two by two matrices, where P and C are just uh, complex numbers. And how does this C star act on, on this matrix? It's just by conjugation. So uh, a complex non-zero scalar then acts with weight uh, two on C and with weight minus two on, on D. So what does all this mean? It means that an SL2R Higgs bundle is then a pair consisting of, um, of a holomorphic C star bundle, E. So this is just a line bundle. And then the Higgs field um, uh, will then, because of this, this uh, weight two action, there will be then uh, holomorphic one forms with uh, have these two pieces corresponding to B and C, which we call beta and gamma. Uh, so one is a, a form of values in L to the minus two and the other in the form of values in, in L squared. Uh, if we think of the corresponding uh, SL2, C X bundle, so that'll be like a usual X vector bundle. Uh, we can also see this, so it'll be a rank two vector bundle, which is just be L plus L dual, and then the X field has this, this shape. Okay, so this was one example, and then here's another very, uh, very closely related example, um, which is just going to the, um, so is just going to the, um, uh, a joint form of SL2R, uh, but I'm going to just, briefly mention it because I, I want to use it later and I want a particular example of this. Uh, so again, uh, maximal compact subgroup is, uh, is going to be the same. Um, and we can uh, represent uh, then uh, the Lie algebra of SL2 uh, with these standard generators. Um, the isotropy representation splits in these two pieces again, just as before, generated by these uh, lowering and raising elements E and F. And in this case, the isotropy representation then acts by weight one because we uh, went to the, um, the, the, the maximal sum compact now got, got divided by, by plus minus one. So, so we only have weight one. And then we can also view an, an SL2 uh, Higgs bundle basically as similar kind of data. So a, a line bundle, ET or frame bundle of a line bundle. And then the Higgs field has these two pieces uh, where now the, the weights are, are minus one and, and one. Okay, and a particular uh, example of, of this kind of PSL2R Higgs bundle uh, that, uh, that I just wanted to introduce here for later reference is when we take the line bundle to be the canonical, the canonical bundle itself. Uh, then, um, uh, so, so then M here is, is K. And what does this mean? This means that in particular n minus one, k is going to be the trivial bundle. Uh, so I can take just the canonical section of a trivial bundle as my uh, Higgs field, and then um, uh, part of the Higgs field, beta part of the Higgs field, and the gamma part I'll just uh, set equal to zero. So in terms of the SL2 R Higgs bundle, we were looking at before this corresponds to, it lifts to this SL2 R Higgs bundle. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, we have a modularized space of, uh, of uh, GR Higgs bundles. I'll call it MGR. Uh, and we want to, um, when you construct a modularized space, of course, you should really first fix some discrete invariants. And the obvious discrete invariant to fix is then the topological class of this underlying uh, H bundle of the Higgs bundle. So I'll just uh, schematically denote that by, denote that by, by C. Uh, so the classification. I remind you, it's given by the fundamental group of, of H. Okay, so this is then the modularized space of GI Higgs bundles uh, of top topological class C. Uh, and the non abelian host theorem, which is like a really fundamental theorem in, in the Higgs bundle area, and probably one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why uh, Higgs bundles are really nice and interesting. Um, uh, so this is a, a Deep and important theorem due to Colette, Donaldson, uh, Hitchin, and Simpson in various uh, various parts of it in various generalities. Uh, and it tells you that this modularized space of, of G Higgs bundles uh, can in fact be identified with a character variety. Uh, which character variety? Uh, the character variety for representations of the fundamental group of the Riemann surface in the group GR. And this is really also why, why we give this name to, to GR Higgs bundles. Um, so this connects to, to, to James Stoke. 
Okay. Um, just one more piece of information. Uh, so uh, this uniformizing Higgs bundle, so remember the one that came from this PSL2 Higgs bundle, which came from taking the, um, the line bundle to be the canonical bundle uh, is particularly important under this, um, under this uh, non-abelian host theorem because uh, um, Hitchin showed that in fact, um, uh, if you take, well, the uniformizing Higgs bundle um, actually gives you exactly the, the function representation that, um, that uniformizes the Riemann surface. And then if you uh, uh, start adding uh, the gamma, piece is going to be a quadratic differential. And if you start then moving gamma away from zero and, and add quadratic differentials to this uniformizing Higgs bundle, you get um, a parametrization um, of a connected component of the character variety, which is uh, identified with the Teichmuller space of the Riemann surface. Okay, so Higgs bundles uh, are nice and they are interesting. And in fact, the non-abelian Hodge theorem uh, gives a very profound connection between um, the geometry of, of uh, the representations of the fundamental group and, and Higgs bundles. And, and this theorem of Hitchin is a is a fundamental ex example of that. Okay, so Teichmuller case space is one interesting connected component of the character variety. Um, but let's now go back to the Higgs bundle side and think of connected components of the moduli space of, of Higgs bundles. Um, so there's a general procedure for, for studying them, uh, which um, uses the so-called uh, Hitchin function, um, which is a proper map uh, defined on the Higgs bundle moduli space, which is really taking the, the L2 norm of the Higgs field. Uh, in fact, you need to use a, a particularly nice metric on the Higgs bundle to be able to define this, but I don't want to go into that. Just let me say that this harmonic metric actually is a key ingredient in the proof of the non-abelian non Hodge theorem. Uh, so we have this, this function and, and the idea is to basically to use this as a MOS function and therefore to find the, the minima of this uh, MOS function and use those to, 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 label the, um, to label the connected components. Uh, this can be interpreted in, in terms of uh, the fixed point of the natural C star action on the moduli space, which multiplies the Higgs field by a non-zero complex scalar. And there's a, a basically a Lie theoretic way of identifying the minima, which I've described here, but which you can at least for now, forget about, we won't really need it. It's just a piece of information. So anyway, the, the key takeaway here is that there's a way of studying a connected component of the, of the Higgs bundle moduli space, um, which, uh, which makes it easier to, to, to study than for instance, the, the character variety. Okay, so just an example. Uh, again, let me go to uh, this basic case of psl 2 r Remind you that uh, the PSL2 Higgs bundle is a, is a line bundle. Um, so T is just going to be my notation for C star. Um, and uh, this was what the Higgs field looks like. Uh, so we have a, a basic invariant, which is the degree of this line bundle. And in fact, it turns out that the components of the moduli space are exactly labeled, labeled by, um, by this, um, this degree. Uh, and, um, and the way you, you prove that is exactly by identifying the minima of this Hitchin functional and seeing that they correspond to beta equal to zero or gamma equal to zero. And then you can prove the connectedness of the corresponding uh, loci of minima. I should also say that uh, uh, in particular in here, remember we have the component parameterized by Hitchin, the Hitchin component um, parameterized by the quadratic differentials and, and that corresponded to Teichmuller space. And, uh, that is exactly the, the maximal case of degree. M equal to two G minus two is the one that corresponds to, to Teichmuller space inside as, as a connected component of the character variety. Okay, so that's a very basic example of, of what we're trying to, in some sense, generalize. Um, so now let's, uh, let's try to, uh, I'll, I'll Tell you a little bit about uh, how, for general uh, general group G, you what what is known about connected components. Uh, first, let's look at the case when we are looking at Higgs bundles for a complex group. So, apologies for the notation, but uh, 
mixed bundles that correspond to, to the character variety for representations in a complex E group. Uh, and uh, this was proved by uh, Oscar Garcia Prada and Andre that uh, in this case, if in fact, our basic topological invariant classifying the H bundle uh, uh, also uh, determines the connected components. So in that case, uh, everything is, is known and as simple and, and beautiful as, as you might expect. Um, now, uh, we also immediately see that this can't really be the case for real groups because already for SL2R, um, well, if we think of the SL2C bundle, at least it's uh, topologically trivial and, uh, and therefore uh, that, that won't, uh, that there'll be just one component. Okay, but um, in general, for, 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 for real groups, uh, the situation is, is not so simple. So they are what we like to call exotic co connected components, um, which uh, uh, have minima where the Higgs field is different than zero, and, and they are somehow not detected by uh, basic topological invariants. And, um, and the first basic example is uh, what's known now as Hitchin components, introduced by Hitchin in the previous millennium. Um, and they uh, correspond, uh, and they arise for, for, for real groups, which are split real forms. So I remind you that the split real form of a, of a complex Lie group is in a sense the, the least compact version. So for instance, the split real form of SLNC is SLNR. Um, and um, and that's, that Hitchin then used Higgs bundles to parameterize uh, nice connected components, which are in some sense similar to that Teichmuller space parameterization I showed you a little while back. Uh, in a quite different direction, um, over the years it turned out that if you look at, um, uh, at a non-compact group of Hermitian types, so yeah, an example, most basic example could be say something like SU. Uh, SUPP say. Um, so the, the corresponding symmetric space is, uh, is actually a, a complex manifold has a, a Hermitian structure. Uh, then there's what's now known as the Cayley correspondence um, uh, and which given this, this uh, real group of Hermitian type associates a different Lie group, looks at Higgs bundles for, for this real Lie group uh, instead of having uh, uh, holomorphic one forms, you, you tensor by the square of the canonical bundle, and then there's a way of, of constructing a, a map from these G prime Higgs bundles to the GR Higgs bundles, um, which embeds, uh, it embeds this as a, as a union of connected components. Now, what happens is that uh, before we had basically topological invariants coming from this group to label some some kinds of uh, connected components or unions of connected components, but here we get more invariants and that's why we have uh, more exotic connected components. Okay, so these are all related to what's called maximal uh, Higgs bundles, which in the case of SL2 are exactly the degree of M equals to 2G minus two, so that maximal degree case that I, I talked about before. Uh, so for a while, for quite a while, uh, it was perhaps thought that these were the only possible cases of exotic connected components, but then uh, a couple of years ago, together with, uh, with, uh, with the team of people I mentioned at the beginning and also Marta Aparicio, um, we actually found, uh, we actually found uh, uh, also that in the case of uh, the group SOPQ, so the group of, of uh, uh, transformations of RP plus Q that preserve uh, non-degenerate product, productic form of signature P comma Q. Uh, there's also uh, a similar story to this Cayley correspondence. So don't worry too much about what I'm writing here, but there's a parameterization of a subspace, which is open and closed, and which has, it gives you more connected components uh, than you expected um, inside the modular space of SOP comma Q responders. Okay, so this is like a botany of a lot of cases that, uh, were appearing and, um, and it was somehow becoming clear that there ought to be a way of putting all this together in a more uh, uniform way. And this is then what I want to try to, to tell you about. Uh, since time is flying, let me just very briefly pass through the first example here of what I want to tell you about. So uh, just let me show you the Hitchin component for SLN plus one. Uh, 
So, well, you can just see that it's parameterized by these parallels of the canonical bundle, and there's a way you can define the Higgs field. It doesn't matter too much exactly, but note that it comes from, from parallels of, of the correct. So you have here um, uh, holomorphic differentials that, that parameterize this component. And here we have uh, uh, an example of the, of the Hermitian situation. Uh, so we uh, described to you here the symplectic group. Um, this is very similar actually to the case of SL2A, which of course is just the case of n equal to one. So this is really completely analogous to SL2A. Okay, let me uh, just uh, note that this also gives extra unexpected um, connected components, and then quickly try to pass to um, to a description of this general uh, Lie theoretic mechanism, which. Um, we found that actually produces these these um, these exotic connected components. All right, so um, uh, so so I'm going to tell you something which is just purely theory. So let's forget about bundles for a while, um, and we can reboot and we just uh, start with some complex uh, complex uh, relativity algebra, uh, and. Um, Let's take a, a nilpotent element of this, uh, this Lie algebra. And uh, then there's a very beautiful theorem of Jacob, called the jacobson morozov theorem, which says that uh, given this nilpotent, we can actually uh, complete it to what's called an SL2 triple, which is just, uh, apart from E, we also get two other elements of the Lie algebra, F and H, such that these three elements uh, satisfy the commutations re relations of of, uh, of SL2C. So we have this uh, subalgebra uh, isomorphic to SL2C uh, sitting inside our, our D algebra. Okay, um, so we have these, these SL2 triples. Uh, and let's then assume we have such an SL2 triple and let's uh, decompose our, our complex D algebra in, in various ways. So first, um, we can take the, the joint action of, of, of the SL2C in there, and then uh, using representation theory, we get uh, decomposition of our D algebra into um, uh, direct sums of, um, of copies of irreducible representations of, um, of, uh, of SL2C. So, so here each WJ is then um, uh, uh, the, the, the n plus n j plus one um, n j plus one uh, dimensional um, is n j plus one copies of the j plus one dimensional uh, representation irreducible representation of SL two C. Uh, we can also just look at this this element H and and decompose into the weight spaces for the action of the joint action of H on the the algebra. So this gives us this decomposition. So these are of course in some sense related. Um, and uh, I also need to just introduce the kernel of the adjoint action of this nilpotent E, which I'm going to call V, and which will uh, have um, uh, then um, uh, graded components Vj, which are just the uh, intersection of Wj with Gj. So this is a lot of, of data, but uh, I'm going to show you a picture which makes it easier to, um, easier to, um, to, 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 to deal with, I hope, uh, at least I find it easier to think of it like that. So here in the rows of this diagram, I put these, uh, uh, these uh, SL2C representation spaces and the columns correspond to the weight spaces for the action of, of H. So um, then for example, uh, this middle column is just um, uh, the, the weight zero space for H um, and, and so on. So in particular, the uh, the, the highest weight spaces for, for, the, for, the, for the actions are sitting up here, right? So these are all, these V spaces are all killed by the adjoint action of E and, and they are then taken down by the adjoint action of, of F. Okay. And we also have this bottom piece, which is then the centralizer because it's the, zero, the, the trivial representation with some multiplicity. So as an SL2C representation, uh, this, is, uh, this is trivial. So this is the centralizer, in fact, of the SL2C. And the SL2C itself, uh, we can see that it must sit in here at this level, right? Because here we have the fundamental representation of, of SL2C. Uh, 
Okay, uh, so we have this decomposition of the Lie algebra, and now uh, this was a complex Lie algebra, so now we want to define an evolution, hoping that we're going to get some, some real form of it. Uh, and we just do it in a, in a very simple way. Um, the idea is that uh, I'm going to draw it for you in a minute, but instead of looking at the formula, just think that our evolution is defined by putting here a plus, and then we put minuses all the way down here, and then uh, Whenever we go one step down with the joint of F, we change the sign. So here we put a plus, we put a plus and so on. And uh, this is how we can then go on. Uh, so uh, there should hopefully be a picture of this in, the, in this slide. And there is. Uh, so, so the involution then, um, this, this involution sigma uh, that I defined in this way is given by these signs I've, I've indicated here. Okay, but this is just a vector space involution, and it may not have anything to do with the Lie algebra structure of, uh, of my Lie algebra. Um, but if we're in very favorable, favorable circumstances, then we have this identity that, that um, the involution respects the bracket in the Lie algebra, and, um, and this is a very nice situation. So in that case, we call this no potent E or the corresponding SL2C triple. We call it magical. Um, so, um, so, and, and these are then the basic, this is the basic the theoretic uh, situation that, that, uh, that will be key for us to, to then define these, these new connected components. Uh, just to take an example of, of a magical nilpotent, um, if you actually take a principal nilpotent, so one which sits in the open orbit under the, under the adjoint action, um, then this is a particular case of a magical nilpotent. So this 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 is uh, actually following from uh, from Costin's Costin's work. Okay, so uh, let's move on then. Uh, ah, no, let's not move on. Let me just remark something important. Uh, magical nilpotents have this uh, property lab in particular. They even, and this means that actually these red bits disappear. Uh, they are all zero, so there are no. Um, no odd, um, no odd uh, representations. So, um, so we only have the, the, the blue dots. Okay, so magical nilpotent gives us a Lie algebra involution, and the Lie algebra involution in turn gives you a Cartan decomposition where you take the plus one and minus one eigenspaces for your involution, and then if you also have a, a compact real form, then which you always have, then you get a actually a, a real form of your complex Lie algebra. And this is what we call the canonical real form. This is the one uh, defined by this Cartan evolution. Okay, and one of our main results then is that uh, we classify uh, magical nilpotents, um, and uh, there are in fact not very many of them. And it's, um, we can, in particular, there's a, there's a, uh, as a consequ consequence of our classification theorem, um, we can say um, which are these canonical real forms that you get out of the magical nilpotents, and here's the list. So the split real forms, no surprise from from constant, uh, no surprise from the things we knew about Higgs bundles. I thought that we get uh, Hermitian groups, non-compact Hermitian groups. Uh, they satisfy something called tube type, um, which is a condition that I don't want to go into, but it's not. Well, it's a particular class of Hermitian group, which are the ones for, for which you have this KD correspondence our friend SOPQ, and then for uh, exceptional cases. Um, okay, um, so um, now um, I need to tell you one final bit of, of Lie theory, uh, which is uh, how we can get a different real form uh, out of this data, and which is the one that is going to give us then uh, the input needed for parameterizing these connected components. So um, uh, remember this, uh, this uh, G0, this weight zero space for the, for the H action uh, we had sitting, I believe I have a, yeah, I have a drawing down here. So let me just first uh, show it to you again, and then I'll, I'll show you the, the diagram. Um, okay, so, so this, this central column of this dot diagram is G0, and at the very top we have C, and then uh, let me call Z2MJ to the, to the other entries. Uh, and then one thing that, that we also prove is that uh, if you have a magical nilpotent, uh, then we know more about the Lie structure and in particular all these 
these Z two M I's and two M J's. When you take the bracket of them, it jumps up to the top piece of this this diagram. Uh, moreover, in fact, most of them are, are, are one-dimensional abelian factors, but there may be one, not more than one, uh, which um, for which we have a, a non non-trivial uh, non-trivial bracket. Uh, uh, which then goes into the to the to the C to the C piece. So here's the here's the figure. This is the drawing which makes it easier to understand. So G zero is this uh, vertical piece. Um, we have uh, somewhere uh, particularly nice. Uh, well, I don't know if it's nice, but a, a, um, a factor which is, is may have dimension higher than one and whose bracket ends up in C. And then we have uh, all the rest here are going to be um, the abelian factors. So then our, our this, this G0, this Lie algebra, uh, then in fact uh, decomposes as all these bunch of abelian factors uh, as this C and as this Z2MC, which, um, and what a different color here, which uh, then brackets into C. And C of course is also a subalgebra. So what does this mean? This means that uh, G0 actually also has a Cartan decomposition. And this one, uh, uh, we call the Cayley real form, so consists of, of, of then the C and then uh, all the rest of the pieces, and then it's convenient to just throw out all the abelian factors and then just call this bit, which has non-trivial bracket, uh, the, the Cayley real form. Okay, uh, in particular, the split case corresponds to the case when, when C is, is, is zero. Okay, so um, this is... Uh, Again, the same diagram. So I think I already drew it for you there. So let me um, uh, maybe let me drop the examples in the interest of, of time. So um, just very briefly, here's a you can see it very explicit. You can work everything out. For instance, here in the case of the symplectic group, and, and here you have the split real form, which which is particularly simple. Instead, let me go back to, to Higgs bundles and try to explain how this helps us to parameterize um, these new, new components. So what's the input? Uh, the input is that we take uh, our uniformizing Higgs bundles. So remember the one that came from taking our line bundle as, as, uh, as the canonical bundle and this canonical piece of Higgs bundles. We take a principal bundle uh, where the C is the group whose Lie algebra is this uh, C piece of the Lie algebra from above. And then we take some, some Higgs fields that I'll tell you about in a minute. And uh, then what is the upshot? Well, uh, let me um, say that um, we can take, maybe let me move these, um, these pieces of the Higgs field down so I can fit everything for you. Okay, so uh, what's the point? Let's take these, um, uh, this this bundle with structure group C. Um, C acts on all these central pieces here. Um, so we have these these uh, these bundle whose fibers are these pieces of the Lie algebra, and we take Higgs fields with values in these pieces, and we twist them by mj plus one. Um, so this gives us a whole bunch of, of Higgs fields that sit in this diagram that sit here. Uh, now remember that the a joint action of, of F actually gives us isomorphisms here. And uh, I'm justified in, in using F because I can think of this F as an, a section of this bundle. So this was just my, my uniformizing Higgs bundle, which remember just gave me here the trivial bundle. So this is why I have the canonical. Uh, this was K minus one, and then the Higgs field here can be defined as this canonical section one of the trivial bundle. And since it's um, K twisted, actually under these isomorphisms, uh, the twist by K goes up by one each time I go down here. And so these, uh, these Psi J's here on this central column will correspond to Higgs fields out here, which are exactly uh, K twisted in the way you want real proper Higgs fields to be now sitting, of course, in the corresponding spaces out here. Okay, so the upshot is that given this data, the C bundle, the uniformizing Higgs bundles and all the, the Higgs field that, that sit here, uh, we can go back and forth to Higgs fields that, that sit out here. So here in the middle, twisted Higgs fields and out here, proper Higgs fields. And 
this is basically what's then giving us our, our map, um, which then, uh, so what do we start with? We start with this pair here, which is exactly a Higgs bundle for the Cayley real form, right? Because the Cayley real form was exactly cooked up in exactly so that this sits in the M piece of the Cayley group and this, this C was the, was the H piece. And then we have all these abelian factors that we can also add. Uh, so remember these, these spaces here were one dimensional. Uh, so that's why we just here take holomorphic differentials, but we can think about them if we want as, as also twisted Higgs fields. And, uh, and the construction I was explaining to then gives us proper Higgs field, right? K twisted. So, uh, and indeed this, these are GI Higgs bundles. Why? Because uh, our, our magical involution here had minus here on all these guys and the plus here. So exactly this gives us a, um, a GI Higgs bundle. And our theorem is in that this map is well-defined, injective, and open and closed. So the image then uh, is a union of connected components. Okay, so uh, if you're very fast, you can read what I read about the proof, but I suggest that you instead uh, try to avoid information overload and uh, just um, uh, forget about that. And instead I'll use, uh, do I have two minutes, André? Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, so in the last two minutes, let me just uh, also skip the example and uh, tell you what this has to do with uh, uh, with, uh, with surface group representations and character varieties. Uh, so just as we saw that uh, Teichmuller space uh, is a very nice connected component inside the character variety for representations of the fundamental group of the Riemann surface in PSL2 air. Uh, there's what's now known as, as higher technical spaces, which are connected components of the character variety, now for our group GR, which uh, like function representations are discrete and faithful. Uh, they have uh, two kinds of examples were known for quite a while, namely uh, Hitchin components. Uh, so this uh, follows from work of, of Lapoki and then fucking Puncherov and uh, so-called maximal components for non-compact groups of, of Hermitian type. So this is essentially work of both Berger, Jot, Berger Jotzi and, and, and Wienhard. Uh, so see that these kind of correspond to the exotic components I, I talked about in the beginning. Uh, so very recently, um, Guichard, Lepourri uh, and Wienhard uh, proposed a general uh, mechanism for higher technical spaces. They introduced what's called theta positive representations, um, which depend on, on the existence of some positive structure on the, on the real D group, uh, which generalizes Lustig total positivity for, for split real forms, which just says that all the, uh, all the minors of the matrix are, are positive. Um, and they classified all the Lily groups that admit theta positive structures. Uh, and um, it turns out that, that their list corresponds to our list. So through classification theory, actually, uh, it's very beautiful to see that these are exactly the, the real, uh, the, the groups whose, whose, whose Lie algebras admit magical nil -possons. So here's a bunch of conjectures by, by Guichard, Lepoti, and Minhat. Um, what is perhaps most important for what I'm going to tell you is that theta positive is a closed condition as well as an open one, and that all higher type spaces should arise as, as components of, of these uh, theta positive representations. Uh, so uh, what we can prove, or what we could prove is that uh, in fact, our uh, Cayley components so coming from our parameterization um, have a non-empty open subset of, uh, which consists of theta positive representations. And um, these representations are in some appropriate sense uh, irreducible. So that's the asterisk meaning appropriate. And then to, um, to, uh, to finish, um, very recently, uh, a paper uh, by Guichard, Lapourier, and, and, and Wienhard appeared where they actually um, prove that uh, theta positivity is closed among reducible representations. And uh, using our result, uh, it follows that uh, Cayley compon components, so our, our, our exotic components, are in fact higher spaces, so consist of, of Higgs bundle who 
whose corresponding representations via the non-abelian Huss theorem are um, discrete and, and faithful. Okay, so still there's a little bit of work to do, but um, uh, uh, who knows? So let me just finish putting up these two open questions. Um, uh, in particular, it's in fact not still not known whether these components uh, account for all higher technical spaces, even though one would expect that. Just for SOPQ by results, also recent results of Baita and Potetti, this this uh, this holds. Okay, so. Um, Thanks for your attention. Um, and sorry for going slightly over time. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. All right. So, are there any questions or comments that someone wants to put? Um, I don't see any. Okay, so I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you don't have to answer me any questions. I don't know. About know this, but I'm sure you can answer <laughs> I don't know if, Right. I don't know if you want to comment uh, that perhaps uh, in a one minute or 30 seconds that we somehow we have uh, information that these components should have, should be geometrically or topologically simpler than the other. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that indeed, um, the deformation theory of this kind of special exotic component Higgs bundle shows you that, that you can have a bit more of a handle on them. And also using this, this MOS function that I showed you to study more uh, refined topological properties of these components uh, should be simpler than, than the general case. Indeed, that's, that's true. Um, uh, also, um, Maybe the answer, at least to the to the second question, ought to be possible through Higgs bundle theory, uh, is perhaps relevant to to mention in the sense that we should be able to identify all connected components using using our tools. Uh, I don't think that's out of reach. And then once you have all the components, you just look at them and decide which ones are, are higher technical spaces and which are not. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, no more questions. All right, so thank you again. Thank you, Peter. And um, okay, that's it. We're done for this uh, uh, algebraic geometry parallel session. Thank you all for being here, for attending. Thank you for the speakers, uh, for their great talks in these quite difficult and strict rules and these uh, short talks. And thank you again. I hope we can see each other in presence in the near future. And meanwhile, enjoy the remaining SPM meeting. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh,